Hello, I'm Manuel Tos, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about Koinonist economics. Now, what's interesting about Koinonist economics is that unlike other uh, systems of government, Koinonism actually doesn't have a lot to do directly with economics, although there are a lot of implications in Koinonism uh, for certain uh, economic events. So what I mean by that is that in Koinonism, economic regulation is decentralized to the communal level. So if you're in a, in a small town of people, that is where your economic regulation is going to happen. And what's important to note is that because of this, you can have multiple economic models being implemented at the same time in different parts of a Koinonist state. At the same time also, these communities can choose to band together for certain economic purposes. So, so for example, when I was speaking with uh, Carl Emmerich uh, discussing this issue of, uh, let's say, public health care, and I said, well, in, in Koinonism, if you want public health care, you can have it, but it has to be the community that pays for it, or you can also team up with other communities that are like-minded, and they will uh, share the cost if they want. And he had the opinion that, uh, well, wouldn't they eventually, wouldn't they all eventually do that anyway? And, and therefore, what's the point of decentralizing it if we're going to uh, have the same result at the end. And I disagreed with him. I said that I don't think that necessarily we're going to have the same outcome uh, when it concerns social programs, because there are different theories as to which show social uh, programs we should have and whether we should have them at all. And because of that, I don't think that there's ever going to be a 100% uh, consensus on exactly which social programs uh, a country should have 100%. And, and because of that, I think rather than playing a, a game of tug of war uh, so that the, the main political factions of a day have to get a compromise or win in order to uh, implement their system, and then a, a large part of the country is disappointed, I think it's a lot easier to decentralize the whole issue, and then allow those who want to cooperate to cooperate, and those who don't want to cooperate don't have to cooperate, and then you have a system that actually caters to the interests of the community, whether those interests are more socialistic and collectivistic economically, or perhaps more individualistic and capitalistic. Both of those systems can be implemented, and that has a, a big impact in a number of different ways. One, in giving people a greater confidence in uh, the stability of their government because the government follows their policies that make them feel more at ease, which also produces a reduced risk of rebellion, which I think is very important, something that I think is not emphasized in a lot of systems of government, except for a lot of authoritarian systems, uh, which uh, do think about the prospect of rebellion. And, and the reason why they think about rebellion is because they understand that if they have it all one way, if they not only not have a compromise, but if they just have it the way they want 100%, that there are obviously going to be people that are going to be very upset with how that system is established and how that system is structured. And to avoid the issue of people being upset, to avoid the issue of uncomfortable compromises in, in a less authoritarian system, I just decided, why not not compromise at all and give out this idea of uh, economic multiplicity, economic pluralism, a uh, not just a, a multicultural society, but a multi-economic society. And when I say multiculturalism, I'm not talking about making compromises in culture. What I am saying is that each community can have its culture, and through the idea of free association, 
people that don't like the culture or the economy or the social policies of the community can leave that community. And people that don't want people destabilizing their community don't have to let them into their community. And that creates a, a way for communities to regulate themselves uh, economically, socially, and culturally. Now, that's being said, there are some winners and losers that come from this. So I think it's, it's very important to recognize that this is not advantageous to big corporations and, and the big banks. And the reason why this is not advantageous for the, these uh, big corporations is because now, instead of having to deal with a unified economy where they can lobby to press their interests, they instead have to keep up a good reputation, in, not just for one government, but for essentially many uh, governments, at least from an economic perspective. And that makes it harder to uh, conduct uh, business in a predatory manner uh, because if you conduct business in a predatory manner, you you don't just have to convince uh, half of the leaders of the country to be on your side. You have to convince every single community that you're interacting with to be on your side. And that means that if a community doesn't like your business practices, they can ask you to change those business practices in their community. And if you don't change them, then they can kick you out. And that is a problem for some large corporations. Now, that being said, this allows for a greater ease in holding these corporations accountable because a lot of things that happen in a more centralized system is that there are local problems. And instead of having local solutions to these problems, you need to go all the way up to the top level of government to get those problems fixed. And when that happens, you end up with a situation where very frequently you have these communities that are neglected and exploited for many years on end, and they don't have any way to solve those problems. Now, once the economic uh, regulatory power is local, then if there are bad and exploitative business practices that become unpopular in the community, they can actually have a way to deal with it. So that's something that I, I think advantages uh, the community and also, I suppose, the workers in the community, because in a lot of communities, there likely are going to be uh, more poorer working class people then there are going to be upper class people. So in that sense, it uh, gives them a greater advantage than they have in, let's say, the United States, where what can happen is that a lot of political campaigning, because it's non-local, you need to, as a politician, you need to build your reputation in a, a broad among a broad range of people. And to do that, you end up having to use the media and commercials, and you can make a lot of appeals. You can make a lot of false promises, and it's hard to be held accountable because you're not living in the same community as all the other people that your choices are affecting, which means that if somebody has a problem with the things that you say, you can simply ignore that person. Meanwhile, if it's all contained within a, a smaller community, what happens is that that complaint can become a movement that leads to you as a politician having to ever take action in order to satisfy the and, and fix the problem that is occurring, or you will be replaced as a politician with someone who is actually willing to get the job done in line with the interests of the community. Now, this also is a big loss for uh, unions, because once this happens, once you're able to regulate this on, on a communal level, uh, the necessity of large labor unions uh, that some people see becomes a, a lot uh, less pronounced. And so in that way, it uh, handicaps unions to some extent. Now, of course, these communities that I'm talking about uh, 
the size limitation that I uh, proposed for them is up to 50,000 people. So you could argue that with a community that's on the upper end of that uh, before it then necessarily has to split in order to keep things manageable, you could argue that maybe there is still room for unions in that. But that being said, I'm not going to say that unions are banned because I don't think they need to be banned. But also I think that uh, the, the union mentality becomes a lot less necessary when the voices of the workers and, and the voices of the people in the community are more easily heard by their politicians that can make decisions to affect change. And not just the politicians, but also the business owners, because if there's a problem in the community, uh, you don't necessarily have to go every time to the mayor to decide what's what's going to happen or to the city council or whatever you have. You can just go to your uh, employer and ask your employer, and then there can be a negotiation in that respect. So that being said, I'm not going to say that all communities will necessarily therefore become social democratic where people get benefits from their employers and there's going to be social programs because I think not everybody wants that. Not everybody wants to be in a highly regulated society. And because of that, there's going to be some communities that use a very minimalistic approach to this where they punish the, the primary crimes, you know, rape, murder, uh, assault, vandalism and such things, but they don't really go much beyond that uh, other than, than keeping the public peace. And, uh, and that, of course, creates a, a different type of system. And then there's some people that may want to collectivize everything where all the wealth is shared within the community. And uh, that's a, a different approach. But what I think is interesting from a, a more macroeconomic perspective is that what you can then can see between the communities is that there is a sort of macro competition that is going to take place where because there are multiple economic models implemented in different areas of the society, you have a situation where let's say you've, you've got a more socialist, more uh, liberalist, more e even fascist, although they're not going to be committing any genocides because that's not allowed. Um, they're, and they're getting into the same economic environment and they're competing. And then there might be innovations in how they want to run their local government, in how they want to structure their economic and social regulation. And those innovations can be implemented in some stages without having to be implemented on the whole system as a whole. And that creates a, an environment of experimentation, an environment that where you can actually make a scientific analysis, where you can compare similar communities and you can see what works, what doesn't work, which systems are effective, which systems aren't effective. And I will say that uh, having looked at a lot of history, even bad economic systems tend to work somewhat. I'm going to be honest here and, and say that they, they might not work as optimally as you want them to work, but they usually work somewhat. Uh, if they don't, they're going to be very short lived. But what I'm what I am saying is that there are uh, non Austrian uh, systems of economics that have functioned for long periods of time. And that doesn't mean that they're better, but it does mean that they can work. And if people have a sort of moralistic opinion about certain economic elements, they may actually want to have an economic system that is perhaps less stable and less effective, but more in line with their values. And that is something that can happen. But I'm not going to say that it is necessarily going to happen in, in every instance, because there are some people that are very interested in economic stability, uh, economic uh, gain, economic prosperity. But there is, of course, going to be a lower limit as to how this is going to work. And, and what the lower limit here 
what what the limiting factor is to the economic systems and coinonism is of course one protecting people's uh basic rights and and ensuring the public peace and ensuring that the country isn't destroyed that that's one limitation and and there's logical implications of that uh but the other limitation is of course the taxation system so what's different about coinonist taxation over the taxation of other countries well the in the coinonist system taxation occurs in a sort of two stage process one stage is the the poll tax stage and the other stage is the communal stage so essentially what happens is the higher levels of government impose a particular tax that is equally divided among the communities based on population and that essentially creates a basic tax burden that is per capita and that creates a necessity for tax efficiency which is going to be the baseline for which economic systems are going to be able to succeed and which ones are going to fail because the ones that can't get enough tax efficiency in order to meet this uh this baseline tax end up uh failing but the ones that can meet that efficiency and and can make a, a, and and prosper above that are the ones that succeed and and that is going to be the limiting factor as to which types of economic models are going to be uh, and, and social models are going to be effective under this system now that being said you you might ask well how do you get to the number that is then divided for each person well first of all on the communal tax before i skip over that once the community gets the amount that they owe which is based on the number of people that they have and based on the size of the uh, the state budget and the budget of the intermediate uh, magisteria once you get that then you have a situation where the community gets to decide how exactly they want to get that money now there's a, a lot of different ways they could do it they could receive aid from other communities they could directly tax the income of their members they could use uh uh tariffs even uh they could do an estate tax they could do a, a, all sorts of different ways any any type of taxation you can imagine because the economic uh, uh regulation and the taxation regulation uh for the local level is decentralized so the community can decide exactly how they're going to reach that uh that tax target now that being said how do you actually decide uh how much tax is owed per capita in the first place well the the way it works is that the different um the, the at the level of of a different magisteria there are going to be different expenses now most of these expenses are going to be linked with court costs and uh and military and law enforcement so in other words you're not going to have expenses linked with uh economic uh regulations there's not going to be uh tax expenses based on social programs because those are all decentralized to the community so they're they're not going to do that there are there's of course tax related to the actual uh income of uh the people working at those levels of government and tax related to um infrastructure that needs to be built to operate at those levels of government and at the very top you're going to have tax related to uh to diplomatic missions uh but uh again that's not too big if you consider the fact that you don't have any government uh, governmental 
economic subsidies for agriculture or for various other things, for pharmaceuticals, for scientific research, uh, and for social programs, for public health care, and for all these other things that a lot of governments spend a lot of money doing, micromanaging their economy, micromanaging their society. Since that's not happening at the top levels, you're not going to have that. It's going to be primarily things that are necessary for the maintenance of the country as a whole, and, and that's going to be the military, uh, being able to engage in diplomatic missions, um, the infrastructure of uh, the military, primarily. That's, that's really what I want to emphasize here, is that the only infrastructure that is going to be built at the top level uh, by the infrastructure commission linked with the Supreme Magisterium is going to be infrastructure that is necessary by the commissions at the top level. So the way the budget works is that there's a, a few important commissions at the top level that deal with this. There's a budgetary commission, there's the financial commission or the finance commission, uh, and there's the monetary commission. So the monetary commission is important because that it regulates the monetary policy of the state. And it's important to note that in Koinonism, you have three primary uh, monetary uh, types of, of, of units. There's the state credit, uh, which, uh, and they're all fiat. Let me be very clear on this. They're all fiat. And the reason why they're fiat is because commodities have an alterable value uh, based on the amount of the commodity. And if you instead have a fiat system, you have a more uh, easily uh, controllable uh, monetary policy. Uh, for example, you, you don't end up in a situation where, let's say, you have the gold standard and suddenly there's a lot of gold coming out and then your currency is is massively uh, uh, devalued. So that's something that can't happen uh, under this unless people decide to suddenly make more money. But the amount of money that the government, the, the amount of monetary supply on the state credit is linked specifically to a proportion of the population. Uh, that is to say that there's only so many monetary units that can be in circulation of the state credit based upon how much of the population there is. So in that sense, it creates a system where the, the monetary policy follows population growth or population decline by not producing more money when there's less people. And this creates a sort of predictable model of monetary policy, which leads to a sense of security. Another thing that uh, the state cannot do is the state cannot uh, borrow money. And I think that's very important. So the state has to rely entirely upon uh, taxation of the state credit, which is the uh, primary amount the, the, the primary payment method uh, that the state is allowed to use. Now, that being said, other local economies can create their own local currencies and base them whichever way they want, but the exchange rate uh, between that and the state credit is going to be regulated by the monetary uh, commission. So that, that's another important uh, element here. There's also the trade credit, uh, which is uh, involved in international exchanges in the sense that the, the state credit cannot be directly exchanged by law uh, with a foreign currency. At the same time, the state credit cannot be uh, exported or imported. So this 
creates a layer of insulation in order to protect the cur- the the state credit from currency manipulation and so what people have to do is they have to if you're getting foreign currency into foreign money into the system you have to buy trade credit and then use the trade credit to buy state credit and that creates a level of insulation there and the trade credit only exists based on demand and and therefore exit circulation when it is uh, traded back for a different currency therefore preventing the growth of uh, the trade credit as its own currency which is to be avoided and also the government cannot directly spend trade credit it has to spend state credit so that that creates an additional level of security that the government can't just buy a million trade credit and use it they're not allowed to do that um the other one is emergency credit which is a a currency that is used if the government is in an emergency and runs out of money in which case they have to for example if they're at war that's probably the the primary reason this would happen uh they have to issue emergency credit and emergency credit can then be redeemed for state credit but this is going to happen based on uh a set uh, rate of growth uh that that is fixed in other words the amount of state credit that you can redeem from emergency credit is uh, a set amount that is greater in value than the state credit's nominal equivalence to the emergency credit so let let's say hypothetically speaking here th- these aren't necessarily going to be the actual numbers let's say you uh you buy 20 units worth of goods uh 20 state credit unions worth of goods but you use a uh a 20 emergency credit equivalent and these goods are probably i don't know military weapons or whatever and then later on those 20 emergency credits can be redeemed for let's say 110 percent that is uh 22 state credits down the line and that's hypothetical these aren't necessarily going to be the numbers uh and so it has a fixed return value. So it's essentially similar to a loan, uh, but instead of having an interest rate that can grow, it has a fixed value of redemption. And that's going to be only used in emergencies when the government doesn't have money uh, and aren't able to raise the taxes because that would ruin the economy. So that's what's going to happen in that situation uh and of course the budget will constitutionally be required to have a certain percentage set aside for the uh redemption of emergency credits uh into state credits so in other words the government is guaranteed to continually pay back emergency credits and, and that creates a, a system where people can know that they will reliably get uh that uh value back although it might take some time depending on how much uh, emergency credit needed to be made there is a guaranteed minimum amount based on the size of a budget that is going to be paid back each year and I think that's important, and that's something that, unfortunately, for example, the British government isn't doing with uh, a lot of its uh, old war bonds 
uh, which people are still holding on, hoping that one day they'll get paid back. But let's be honest, when is that going to happen, really? So you, you've got these 100-year-old war bonds from in, in the UK. But anyway, getting back on track, another portion of the budget is going to be held up for a, a sort of splash fund in case you end up going over budget before being able to raise taxes. In other words, the government is specifically taking money without the intention of immediately spending it. And if the government stays on budget year after year, that means they actually accumulate a large amount of extra money that they can then, in theory, use instead of having to use emergency credit. So emergency credit uh, is a, a last resort in that sense. So, so the government essentially has a, a more traditional approach to uh, a treasury where they literally have money stashed away that they're not doing anything with. Now, a lot of people in... This is, of course, bad for the big banks because, number one, the government isn't taking any any loans with usury. Uh, so that's something that the banks can't profit off of. And also the government has a, a fixed uh, amount of monetary supply growth, which uh, means that you can't play around with, uh, with a, a large amount of inflation rates leading to a lot of savings and also the government has money that it's explicitly stating that it will not spend which leads to a situation of, of dis savings and potentially uh, the inflation from the increased monetary supply is balanced not only from people growing up and entering into the workforce but also by the fact that the government in a prosperous period is not necessarily going to be putting as much money back into the system. So this creates a situation where economic growth leads to deflation, which leads to dissavings, uh, and it sort of hits the brakes, which is something that I think is something that's missing from uh, a lot of governments that exist uh, in the world today is that there's this idea that we need to keep the economy constantly growing and we want it to grow fast. And what I say is that the problem with that, the problem with a large amount of financial investment in banks and the stock market is that well, that creates a more dynamic economy uh, in, in the sense that it can grow a lot faster. It can also collapse a lot faster, too. So that's something that I want to avoid primarily on the level of a government. You know what? If on the local level, people want their big banks, they can have them. OK, they can have them. If they want them. if people want their banks, their stock markets, etc., they can have them. It's just not going to be affecting the government, which is what I think is important, or at least not directly. Of course, if throughout the country, people are doing bad economically, that's going to affect the government because then they'll have a, a, a lower uh, amount of tax that they can uh, successfully extract from the population. Uh, however, speaking of the tax, so the different commissions on the Supreme, uh, link to the Supreme Magisterium, put together the demands that they expect uh, budgetarily for the next year. And then they deliver that to the Budgetary Commission. And the Budgetary Commission then compiles this into budget proposals and uh, and also uses information to gauge what the tax burden would be 
based on the budget proposal and then delivers that to the Supreme Magisterium, which then chooses whether to make modifications on the budget and whether to approve it or to deny it. And in this case that a new annual budget has not been approved, then what's going to happen is that all the commissions are going to receive a new budget that is simply uh, adjusted proportionally to the population, and therefore the ta taxation is also adjusted proportionally to population increases or decreases. And that is what happens automatically if no budget is agreed upon. So you're not going to end up in a situation where the country doesn't have a budget. They're just simply going to keep the status quo if you don't reach an agreement. But again, because of the way that the government is structured, it's going to lead to less partisan interests and also less business interests. And, and that is going to create a situation where I think that uh, a, a huge conflict on how big the budget should be is less likely to occur uh, because the politicians have to be more experienced and more skilled at their jobs in order to reach the point where they actually decide the total budget. Now, of course, the lower magisteria have their own budgets and those add on to the budget until it reaches to the bottom level. Although it, the, in, in the intermediate magisteria, it's not going to be as uh, impactful as the supreme magisterium because the supreme magisterium simply has more things that it does than the intermediate magisteria. Now, because of this, because the budget and the monetary supply uh, and uh, the taxation uh, is largely related to the amount of a population, getting accurate population statistics is very important legally, uh, which means that if someone intentionally gives false population statistics, because if you, if you under-report the number of people living in your community, you get a big tax break. And that's something that uh, should not be allowed. Uh, at the same time, over-reporting may... Well, I, I can't really think of any particular advantage that that would have. But essentially, you want to avoid people under-reporting. So the, the community that people live in is, of course, going to be known in order to create accurate population statistics that allow you to get uh, an accurate uh, amount of taxation down. So at all times, the government is going to know how many people live in the country. And, uh, and at the very minimum, they're going to know who lives in what community. They're probably not going to know a lot beyond that, besides uh, criminal records and court records and such things. But uh, at least on the individual level. Now, when it concerns the actual communities, uh, the Information Commission is going to, beyond having population statistics, they're going to know the uh, the surveying statistics on the borders between uh, the communities. They're going to know uh, the all the laws that are implemented because th the way that the legal system works is you can't have a uh, a customary law or a a case law. All laws have to be uh, actually written and enumerated, and because of that everyone can then easily know what the law is by looking at the law. So, so we're only operating on statutes uh, in Koinonism. And, and that means that the Information Commission is going to collect all the legal codes from uh, all the different communities, and they're going to know exactly what the laws are. And not that they're going to do anything in particular with it, uh, Maybe if they see something that's illegally happening, an illegal law occurring, they will report that because it's important to fix that. Because if there's a law that violates people's rights, that's obviously something that you don't want happening. 
So that's uh, important in that respect. Although we're, we're not really getting into the economic aspect in, anymore on that side. But anyway, the Financial Commission is responsible for essentially holding the money that uh, the Supreme Ma- Magisterium uses and also collecting the money from the lower magisteria uh, as they uh, receive it. Because the way the taxation works is rather than directly going to each uh, community and the different levels of government, each getting together and placing uh, their own taxation separately on all the communities, the taxation is divided between the magisteria based on the population of each and then divided down until you reach to the actual communities. So they're not going to get 20 different bills from different levels of government. They're going to get one single bill that then they that they then pay to the uh, magisterium that is immediately above them that is then paid up until it reaches to the top level. So that's how uh, the monetary... Uh, that's how the taxation goes in that sense. And uh, I, I think it's simpler than having it the way that the U.S. has, where you can have the federal income tax return. Uh, you can have the state taxes. You can have the county tax. You can have the city tax. And uh, although you could, in, in theory, put them all, do them all at the same time, it's complicated because it uh, goes around. And instead, in this system, you simply have a system where they tell you how much you owe on a communal level, and then the community gets to decide how they want to collect that money, whether it is through income tax, uh, through tariffs, through uh, taxing people as as uh, they go in and out of the community, etc., and, and various things. So... That's important. Now, internationally, international trade economically in coinism is a bit complex because, well, or, or simple, depending on how you think about it. It's simple in the fact that because the central government isn't dealing with uh, the actual um, economic regulation, they're not dealing a lot with what people are trading uh, in and out of the country. So it, that's they're not actually going to be dealing with that specifically. Now, that being said, the, the one exception where the central government is actually going to be involved in an economic sector is probably going to be uh, when it concerns supplies for the military, uh, because getting that uh, together is very important regardless of how big your country is it's important to ensure that if you have a military that your military has a reliable source of supplies and so that's going to be the the primary place and really the only place where the government the central government is going to be more involved uh financially with uh, any industry uh, and that is going to be, uh, you could say, the military-industrial complex. Uh, but it's something that you can't really get away from. But in in the sense of the way the government is structured, it's not as if the corporations in the military-industrial complex would have any particular influence upon the government. So because of the way that the government is structured, they can't really exercise their influence on the government directly other than through market competition uh, and by essentially making better products or less expensive products that uh, are useful for the military. And also they're not directly interacting with the Supreme Magisterium, they're interacting with the the Armed Forces Commission. And that is going to, of course, uh, have different implications. Uh, But when it concerns international trade, the central government isn't going to do much besides on the currency commission, they they might have a small exchange fee for exchanging currencies 
for individuals and corporations that are not based within the state. And, and that is, I, I suppose, a minor, and, and, and that money then is used in one way to help operate the monetary exchanges of the currency commission and in in another sense in uh helping to i guess get a, an additional income but it's probably not going to be very large compared to the actual primary income which is of the state that is which is based on taxation rather than the currency exchanges so they're not going to rely on having big currency exchanges and that sort of discourages the central government from uh really trying to cut corners in order to rely on trade at the same time you might say well if the central government decides how much budget they want then how is how's that fair because can't they just give themselves as much budget as as they would like well the answer is they're directly accountable to the level of government below them uh, so getting away with asking for more money is not going to be very popular. Uh, so they're really going to have to justify when they raise the budget. Because it's not as if they can make a general appeal to the populace and then bypass all the intermediate levels of government. They, in fact, have to deal with the level of government immediately below them which then has to deal with the one immediately below it going on until you reach the people. So in that sense, there is a, a chain of accountability in Koinonism that uh, refines the leadership ability of people climbing the ladder and also ensures that they are always held accountable in a very direct and personal sense. So that exists. Uh, additionally, taking bribes is completely illegal uh, in the magisteria. So, or for for any uh, policeman even, but especially in the magisteria, where what normally would be considered campaign contributions in places like the United States would actually be uh, entirely illegal on the higher levels of government, where you can get the death penalty. So. That that's a way to keep uh, uh, a lot of uh, special interests out of uh, trying to lobby the government because they can't actually contribute to the politicians in a direct sense. They they have to pay their taxes like everybody else, and uh, and they're going to be several steps removed from uh, where those taxes are being spent the higher up you go. But internationally, the currency exchange rate is uh, operated by the Currency Commission, uh, which is going to have to, of course, come to a consensus with, with whatever country they're dealing with uh, for a, uh, a justified exchange rate. And... Uh, also, since uh, the economic regulation is decentralized, it means that local governments can choose to ban imports from certain countries and can choose to ban uh, secondary imports uh, from, uh, when I say secondary, I mean imported once and then again. Uh, that is to say, imported from the foreign country that they don't like, and then the second time imported from one of their other communities. They can choose to ban that as well if they really want to. Uh, and that can create uh, perhaps gaps, uh, trade gaps, economic uh, barriers within the country, which, of course, big corporations don't like. But, well, they're going to have to deal with that because if the communities don't want to trade with each other on certain points, they don't have to. and and that's something that can happen. So in that sense, people might say that pe people that object to the idea of 
complete open borders trade here and 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 trade everywhere and uh getting the jobs overseas actually have a way to express that without having to to uh deal with the people that want to do that so there could very well be multiple uh economic uh not just systems because the systems are in the communities and in the communities that choose to get together on on common regulation and such things but also uh trade blocks within the country can exist there can exist multiple trade blocks which is different from the US because in the US uh international and even interstate trade is regulated by the central government uh but in this case it isn't and not only is it not regulated by the central government but the full power to regulate it exists on the local government so that can lead to very interesting uh and and i would say economic situations that would be very interesting to explore and and that's the great thing that i think about quinonist economics is that there's a lot of potential for exploration there's a lot of potential for experimentation there's a lot of potential for scientific study of economics that exists in coinism that cannot exist in more centralized economic systems even the uh, libertarian type systems so because there's a greater variety of economic uh systems available i say that this is a greater liber- liberty than that of liberalism uh which is is ironic in in a sense because the the greater liberty is being able to choose to be less free in some ways and and to do that as a community because not everybody wants to be free to the fullest extent some people like relying on the government for certain things and saying that no you can't do that is something that i think is going to be a relatively unpopular position with certain folks so instead of saying that we we're going to get the perfect uh the the perfect austrian economics and it's going to lead to big prosperity for everyone i instead say let's allow people to be less prosperous if they want to be if people are less prosperous and they choose to be it will be in their community it will be their responsibility and by allowing them to take that kind of responsibility i think it leads to a greater potential uh, uh, for different lifestyles existing it, that is to say a greater liberty a greater amount of options for people rather than having to decide to obey one system or having to decide to compromise with their political enemies instead deciding to get in a community with like-minded people and we'll see if this works and if it doesn't work then we'll all have learned a lesson not just us in the community but everybody surrounding us watching us wondering whether we will succeed it will be educational because what happens is sometimes economic systems fail but they end up coming around again and people try again and rather than saying no let's never try that again uh i say well you can try it and if it fails again then you'll have learned a lesson and then maybe in the next generation someone will try it again and they'll have learned a lesson and we'll keep this these these economic lessons fresh in our cultural memory in the, in the memory of our society they will be fresh because we will be able to experience those economic failures in each generation and the economic successes in each generation and we'll be able to contrast them in in real time at the same time all the time and that is something that i think is is great and that is the the core i i think a uh, thing that i i think is amazing about coinist economics but anyway thank you all for watching tell me what you think 
Is there some point where you agree, some point where you disagree, some point where you have a differing opinion? And uh, please tell me in the comment section below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be seeing you all next time. And we'll toss over and out.